This is Duke University. Welcome to Day in Durham. Thank you for being here. We're excited to have you. Uh, I know you've been going through a lot this summer with GIE and just getting here to Fuqua, but we're excited to meet you and have you at this event. Promise us to be a really exciting day. We have our Fuqua leadership in here, both Bill Bolding and Russ Morgan. Let's thank them for being here. and an exceptional lineup of organizations for you to see and talk to later this day. We have nearly 20 amazing Durham-based organizations that will be speaking to you, um, brought to you by the Net Impact chapter and CASE. Um, we have several second hairs here leading you and excited to talk to you about their experiences both this summer and looking towards the future. We have three major sponsors we wanted to thank, John Deere, Deloitte, and Education Pioneers. You'll be hearing more about them later today as well. And Mark and I, Mark is your other co-leader here this, this today, we are just excited and thrilled to have you and um, welcome you to Dan Durham. I'm going to turn it over to him. Good morning, guys. I'm going to talk a little about the history and the purpose of Dan Durham. So 2012 marks the ninth consecutive year of Dan Durham. Since its inauguration, Dan Durham has grown year on year to become one of Fuqua's marquee events, a chance for first years to take a break from the rigors of Global Institute and the even greater rigors of evenings at Shooters <laughs> to connect with for what many is a new home, a new community. Think of this as Fuqua's own small effort to welcome you to Durham beyond the insular bubble of our school and our university. Moreover, they in Durham represents a strong legacy which you inherit as servant leaders within our community. As stewards of the strong ties that Fuqua has developed with the Durham community, of ties that unite us across barriers such as race or socioeconomic status. Fuqua is unique among top tier business programs and one of our hallmarks is our student body's commitment to social and environmental progress. We welcome you to build upon this tradition and mark of differentiation. Since its inception, Day and Durham has remained true to three major goals and they can be summarized loosely as understand, connect and serve. First, understand. Day in Durham is about helping you to understand how your MBA education and skill set, which you've already begun to acquire, directly empowers you to tackle complex social problems. You may not have realized this, but the skills you're developing will prove just as useful, if not more, in helping solve our society's greatest problems in fields such as education, healthcare, and economic development, as they will in traditional business settings. Number two, connect. It's a little known secret, but Durham and the broader RTP region is home to one of the nation's most vibrant and fast growing collections of organizations focused on social and environmental impact. From international companies like Burt's Bees to regional crown jewels like Troza and innovative startups like Schoolhouse and Student U. The triangle is teeming with organizations that are enhancing uh, our region and the world at large in myriad ways. Day in Durham is designed to give you a taste of what's already out there and to start plugging you into this dynamic ecosystem of problem solvers. Finally, number three, and most importantly, serve. Ultimately, our hope is that you will come out of today's event, event inspired to embark on your career as a servant leader. We talk a lot at Fuqua about becoming leaders of consequence or global leaders. We take these terms seriously, and these are some pretty tall orders. But I believe that the best way to live up to such goals is through action. And you can do this by volunteering in your local community in Durham. That's why the back of these shirts read, Global Leaders Start at Home. There are a plethora of ways in which you can volunteer while students at Fuqua, ranging from sitting on the board of a local nonprofit through Fuqua On Board, or mentoring school-age youth through junior achievement. I'd now like to welcome to the stage Abigail Lundy and Elena Bohm, our two co-presidents of Fuqua's Net Impact Club. Good morning, guys. 
Um, I'm Abigail Lundy. This is Alana Boehm, and we're serving as this year's co-presidents for Net Impact, and we are so excited that you guys are here. Um, I think for both of us, this is one of our absolute favorite days as first years, um, and are really excited about what you guys are getting ready to experience. Um, and there are far more important people that you're going to hear from today, so we'll be very brief. Um, but we first just wanted to take a second and recognize Don and Mark and Ruth Tolman on Fuqua staff for pulling this event together. They have just put in so many hours over the summer and been really creative and innovative and deliberate in creating this experience for you. So just a quick round of applause for them. And then we just want to give you a, a brief overview of Net Impact. Some of you guys might already be familiar with it, but for those of you who aren't, um, we are Fuqua's largest student-run organization. Um, we're really proud of that because we think it speaks to the um, myriad ways that people are finding ways to do good through business, and we try to meet people kind of all along that spectrum. Um, and we're also really excited and proud that we were just selected as um, one of the top three, three graduate chapters for Net Impact nationally. So there's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of really awesome stuff happening here at Fuqua, and we're excited to see you guys engage with it over the next two years. Um, and so, you know, Net Impact is really about kind of combining the business and corporate world with uh, the social sector and finding ways that each of those areas can learn from each other and can collaborate with each other um, to do good and do well. Uh, and so we at Fuqua have created this mission statement, and it really speaks to what Mark was talking about earlier. But you guys are here in part because you want to be leaders of consequence. Um, you, want to, you want to have a positive impact in whatever you do without, throughout your career. And we think that Net Impact is really a great place for us to serve you as you develop that part of your leadership capability. So uh, this is our, our mission statement and what we're going by this year is uh, um, the wording was all decided upon by the second year Net Impact cabinet and something that we're really, really passionate about. Um, and so I just want, I'm going to turn it over to Alana, who's going to talk a little bit more about the specifics of what, we, what we're going to offer you guys over the next year and ways that we would love to see you all engage with the club. Uh, so as you saw in our, our mission statement, we really think about the club as offering and, and providing four types of um, support and ways to connect. One is through education, and that's um, both large-scale formal events and small-scale lunch and learns. That's uh, networking opportunities with alumni, with um, people in the field, with other students. Um, skill building to make sure that you have the skills you need to be impactful in the sector. And finally, career support, um, both for your internship and long term. So uh, we have a few specific events coming up in the next few months that we hope you'll consider um, getting involved with. Uh, there's a happy hour on Wednesday, um, a club fair for all the clubs, including that impact. Um, there's a impact careers for kind of social, an overview of kind of the sector in terms of careers if you're new to this space <coughs> or want to learn more. Um, we have an official net impact info session and then a Fuqua Friday that we're sponsoring. It should be really fun. So these are just a snapshot. Um, the way to really get LinkedIn is to uh, sign up on campus groups if you're not already. We'll have a newsletter coming out tomorrow with all the info that you need. Um, we have a lot of really cool events coming up. Um, we have a huge conference coming up in February that is the largest social impact conference in the Southeast. Um, we do a lot with both sustainability and social impact. And I think there's, there are ways for you to plug in, um, you know, depending on how involved you want to be, what your background is, and what you're looking to get out. So we, Abigail and I, are so excited to meet each and every one of you over the next um, few months. And please do not hesitate to reach out to us with any questions or thoughts that you have. So thanks again for coming out. We're excited for a great uh, talk by Kevin and a, and a fantastic day in Durham. Several points. Number one, tweet. Hashtag DID12, I'd like you to tweet as much as you can, tweet your hearts out. Number two, crowdsourcing photos. We want you to take as many, many pictures as you can now on your excursions, put them up on Facebook, put them up on Twitter, we'll find them, we'd love that. Um, number three, if you didn't get a, a name tag, there's name tags in the lunch rooms, you'll get them there. Number four, um, let me think about number four. <laughs> Blanky. I'll get back to you on that one. But I'd like to now introduce Matt Nash, the executive director of Case, say a few words. Well, thanks, Mark, and welcome, everybody. This is definitely one of my favorite days of the year. It's actually my eighth day in Durham, and I'll tell you, every year has just gotten better and better and better. And so I, I 
congratulate you for taking a time on a Saturday morning when you might otherwise want to be taking a break and instead uh, taking a closer look at Durham and seeing how you can use your, your skills. Uh, just a real quick introduction. If you're not familiar with CASE, we're the Center for the Advancement of Social Entrepreneurship. We are a research center here at uh, the Fuqua School of Business dedicated to promoting the entrepreneurial pursuit of social impact. And as we're in a business school, we're especially interested in the thoughtful adaptation of business expertise to address some of the world's most critical uh, pressing problems. And uh, we're one of the top centers of our type in the world. And I'll tell you, we really couldn't do our work without the close collaboration of our colleagues across the school. We work very closely with the Career Management Center, work very closely with Russ and his team, uh, and with um, the Financial Aid Office and the Dean's Office and marketing and so forth. So we are a, a team that's integrated with the rest of the school. So make sure you see K certainly as a hub, but we have uh, colleagues across the school that work very closely with us. I'm also really proud to tell you this is our actual 10th anniversary this fall. And um, yeah, thank you. Now we have a group of second year students who work with us called the Case Fellows, and we also have a group of second year students who work with our Case uh, Impact Investing Initiative, the Case I3 Fellows. And so we're planning some exciting events this fall to kind of celebrate that 10th anniversary. Uh, we are one of the oldest uh, centers on social entrepreneurship in the world, and so we want to do some things to celebrate that, involve you. We'll have some speakers and events that you're going to be more than welcome to attend. Now, I can't tell you how proud I am of this club. It's just been an amazing club to work with. I've seen it over the years win Club of the Year for the school a couple times. We've seen it this year being in the top three. And if you go to the Net Impact Conference, which I really encourage you to do, we usually have one of the strongest and largest contingents there. We might even be named Club of the Year. So it's just an amazing club. I want to congratulate the leaders of the club for putting this event together and the, and the organizers. So let's give them a round of applause. I've seen this event grow from 60 to, you know, 200 or so. It's just amazing. And let me also tell you one thing. Durham is a special place. You know, I really didn't know much about Durham before I decided to, to come to, uh, to Fuqua to work at Case. I certainly had known of Case and the amazing work of uh, my colleague Greg Dees and so forth, but I, I really didn't know much about Durham. And I'll tell you, I love Durham. I think I'm a long-term resident here. Uh, it's just, it's a special place for a number of reasons. One is just a rich heritage of entrepreneurship and social innovation in this area. You know, it turns out that Durham is located at the crossroads of some Native American trading paths. Uh, in the late 1700s, there was an entrepreneur here who really funded the westward expansion of Daniel Boone and others. Uh, you know, through the 1800s, uh, the, the Duke family, you know, the work they did with the uh, tobacco, some of the interesting things they did is they acquired some patents on some uh, machines that allowed them to mass produce. And so what that did is allowed a creation of a middle class here in Durham, including an African-American middle class. And so we have some really amazing areas of downtown called Black Wall Street is one area. There's a museum down there. You can look at that. There was a growing uh, African-American middle class. Uh, one of the, the oldest African-American owned insurance company in the, in the country is here. The second oldest African-American bank is here. It's a really interesting, vibrant uh, uh, community. And it turns out as we moved into the 50s, there was a really vibrant uh, community here focused on civil rights. Some of the early lunch counter sit-ins uh, came from here. Some of the early civil rights leaders and, and advocates came from this area. And it turns out the really interesting work has been done in um, self-help, for example, is the largest community development finance institution in the country is right here in Durham. An amazing credit union, they do advocacy on uh, against predatory lenders. Uh, you know, Research Triangle Park not only has you know, spawned many, many interesting commercial innovations, but social innovations as well. AZT, the drug to uh, address AIDS, was actually developed there. So fascinating thing. I think you would not have as good of an experience as you could have at Fuqua and Duke if you don't take the time to get involved. So I really encourage you to look at the back of your shirt and realize that, yes, you know, global leaders start at home. Join Fuqua on board, or volunteer, or do a mentored study, or join the Fuqua Client Consulting Program and do a practicum here uh, or abroad. Or, or just take time to, to patronize some of the wonderful restaurants downtown, or go to some of the performances, and you'll realize you're living in a magical place. So I encourage you to do that. And I'll tell you, I, I don't think there could be a better guest speaker today than Kevin Trapani. So what I'd like to do is turn it back over to Mark to introduce Kevin. Hope you uh, join me in welcoming uh, Kevin. And again, have a great day. And come on over to Case sometime. We'll have an info session in a few weeks and events through the fall. Come join us. Thanks, Matt. It's now my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for the event. Kevin Trapani is a man of integrity, passion, and action. He is the founder and chief executive officer of the Redwoods Group, a non-traditional insurance provider 
protecting YMCAs, nonprofit resident camps, and Jewish organizations, among others. He describes the Redwoods Group as a for-benefit organization, one which was not founded to make money but as a way to protect children. To that end, his organization works with its clients not merely as traditional customers but as mission partners and utilizes a combination of data analysis, education, insurance coverage, and crisis response in order to carry out its mission. Beyond this, Kevin is also a member of Case's advisory committee and devotes time to a number of organizations such as North Carolina Public Radio, the Triangle Land Conservancy, the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions, and Chicago Commons. In short, Kevin is a local community leader, a successful social entrepreneur, and, as you're about to find out, a truly gifted public speaker. Please join me in welcoming Kevin Trapani. All right, calm down. There's no chance I'll meet those expectations. <laughs> I really want to thank you for being here and for having me here. I had the distinct pleasure to uh, welcome last year's class. And I guess my speaker's fee was competitive, so they invited me back. <laughs> um, guys, thanks for being here. This is uh, it's really special to have you, you here and support for this group. We were talking you know, before we started. This is a wonderful incoming class. I think you could argue you know, among the best at business schools anywhere on the face of the planet. Uh, but you all are special, um, I guess, because you got up this morning and came to this event, but also because you self-identified to be here to connect with this place. And so what I want to do today is just take a few minutes to deepen your connection with this place at this time and to talk about what it means to connect your opportunity with your obligation, not just today, but in the future. So I want to thank you for the opportunity. We're going to talk about a whole bunch of different things today, from business responsibility to moral courage to the digital data divide. And if we can do that in the next 30 minutes, I demand a significant round of applause. <laughs> um, you've already heard uh, a couple of admonitions to share what you uh, hear today. If there's, on some off chance, something I say that sounds brilliant to you, there's little chance of that happening. But if it happens, feel free to share it. Um, there's, I think we've all learned that social media is one of the best ways to kind of share our experience and have a multiplier effect uh, for, uh, for what we're uh, experiencing ourselves. Um, I also want to take just one second to solve a problem. You all have been together now for a better part of three weeks, I guess. Um, and you've been in some intense learning situations. You've been with your small groups. You've been with larger groups. And um, at about this time, you're probably wondering who's the smartest person in the class. Right, there's this little competition to figure that out. I want to share with you who that is, because I just want to get that done, all right? get it off the table. The smartest person in the class is Matt Walsh. He's in here somewhere. Right? There's Matt right there. Smartest person in the class. OK, just take that on faith. Now, here's the deal. <laughs> Matt is an incredibly brilliant guy. He's going to add an awful lot to Fuqua over the next couple of years. He also dates my daughter. <laughs> Anybody want to push back on that? OK, so let's take a second. Um, <laughs> I'm going to pay deeply for that. I just want you to know. That's just never going to go away. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, I want to change the tone for a second and begin to work on this exercise and giving you a sense of place and time. And um, we'll ask a friend of ours to lead us through this introduction by using a song that you've probably heard. Misty sunrise in my hometown, rows of cotton about knee high. Mrs. Baker down the dirt road, still got clothes out on the line. Erwin Nichols there with Judge Lee, playing checkers at the gym. When I dream about the Southland, this is where it all begins. From Carolina. Georgia, smell the jasmine and magnolia, sleep the sweet home, Alabama, roll tide or roll, muddy water, Mississippi, blessed Graceland whispers to me, carry on, carry on, sweet 
southern comfort carry on Catching catfish on the river Chasing fireflies by the creek Kissing Gary Williams' sister On the porch home coming week With rusty cars and weeping willows Keeping watch out in the yard just a snapshot of down home Dixie Could be anywhere you are In Carolina or in Georgia Open arms are waiting for you Louisiana, Yellow Rose of San Antonio Arkansas, Mississippi Old Man River whispers to me Carry on, carry on James Baldwin is a historian who studied the South for 40 years. The South is my home. I did about half my growing up in Alabama and North Carolina. I now live in Chapel Hill, deeply involved in Durham. Proud to be here. Like Matt, I chose to be here, and I'm not going anywhere. And I'm delighted to have you involved in this place. But this place is a conundrum. And I want to make sure that you understand that what's happening here in the South is happening in the rest of the country as well. You probably know that about 15% of Americans, one in six, lives in poverty. It's probably not news to you. What you might not know is that poverty, this definition of poverty, is a actually arbitrary line produced by the federal government. Poverty for a family of four is about $23,000 a year make $24,000 a year as a family of four, you're not considered to live in poverty. Something else is important to understand about poverty here in the United States. In 2000, we had 11% of our people, about a third less, living in poverty. In the last decade, we've moved 15 million Americans into poverty. We're not making progress. We're losing ground. So you might ask, when we talk about poverty, why is it so pervasive? I want to take just a second and shift your perspective a little bit. Because there are two kinds of poverty. One is situational poverty. The other is generational poverty. Situational poverty is what happens when you have a, an appropriate lifestyle, let's say, for middle class America, and you have an uninsured medical event, a loss of a job, whatever might happen, and you end up temporarily poor might be homeless for a night or two. Generational poverty is what happens when we start looking at the lack of social class mobility here in the United States, which, by the way, is at its lowest level since the 1920s. There has recently, in describing generational poverty, become something that's um, kind of current in the political discourse, and that is this idea of blaming the poor. The poor would not be poor if they just graduated from high school and didn't have babies so young or whatever the kind of easy answers might be. I want you to understand that that, that personal pathology paradigm is really an incredibly aggressive form of social engineering. It's a little like saying that if you just played tennis, you'd do better on the SATs. Yes, statistically, I understand that those who don't graduate from high school are more likely to be poor. I get that. But we have to ask ourselves the question, why didn't they graduate from high school? Because then you start saying, why did they grow up in a single parent family? Why did they grow up with inadequate access to education or health care or economic opportunity? People don't choose to be poor. In fact, the poor in this country often have a greater work ethic than the rest of us. They work multiple jobs. They save through layaway. They cook at home. These are people who want to succeed. They're not poor by choice. Now, are there people who make bad decisions? You bet. There are people in every social class who make bad decisions. Are those of the poor who want to succeed more deserving of help than those who maybe are not willing to do with what they have? Sure. 
I love the idea of helping those who need a hand and want to lift themselves up. I think that's terrific. But let's not pretend that these people are poor by choice. And let's not pretend that letting them continue to be poor, an increasing number of them being poor, is OK for us who are not. Because it's not. There are jobs going unfilled because we're not doing an adequate job of educating our poor or our entire populace. These people become consumers of public assets. If you don't buy the moral argument that we need to lift up those at the margin, you're going to buy the economic argument because they are becoming an increasing burden on the rest of society. We have to talk about this in a different way. And the idea that they are choosing to be poor is abhorrent to me. This number is the number of states where somebody working full time, 40 hours a week, can afford to rent a two bedroom house. This is the number of states, none, nowhere. Half of the jobs in this country pay less than $34,000 a year. Low wage jobs may be short term good for consumers, but they're not good for economic prosperity for our whole society. They're just not. We have to move to a different place. And so you say, well, OK, but there's a social safety net for those people. I want to talk about two different kinds of social safety nets for just a moment. I experienced the first one. I got fired three times in the early to mid 90s. In each case, I thought I was smarter than I was. I was in jobs bigger than I was capable of handling very well, and I got fired. And in each of the cases, I ended up with a pretty good severance package, a significant social network. In the first two cases, I got a job relatively easily that was bigger than the one I gotten fired from. Makes you wonder it's a little bit like being a major league baseball manager. Right? <laughs> Once you're one, you can get another job. That's kind of what I went through. I had all kinds of people who I was connected to. I had a terrific social safety net, only the third time when I decided I was going to start something on my own, was it a little bit tougher? Only the third time did I have to come to a point where I wasn't sure how I was going to be able to pay the mortgage and still build a dream. That's the only time that happened to me. Believe me, I wasn't poor. I had a social safety net that comes from spending a life of relative wealth. I was connected to the right people. I had skills and education and background that people who get fired typically in the lower end of our economic spectrum don't have. That social safety net they have are various programs of social support that might be called welfare in general. And so you know about welfare. When we got to the end of the last decade, about 2 thirds of all the kids who lived in poverty, that number that was $23,000, which of course wasn't $23,000 10 years ago, but that number, about 2 thirds received welfare assistance. It's now called TANF, Temporary Assistance to Needy Families. That number is now 27%. If you think the discussion now about whether we're now ripping apart the social safety net is important, that horse is out of the barn. It's gone. It's in tatters. These people who we're supposed to be helping do not have access to some of the most basic services that they need. So not only are they not adequately educated, not only do they not have adequate access to housing and health care and other kinds of things, they also don't have the financial assistance that is absolutely essential. Almost 10 million people in this country have as their only income food stamps, almost 10 million people. We're in a desperate situation. Now, by the way, I've spent a little time talking about the American South. I spent a little bit of time talking about the rest of the United States. And on this issue of people choosing to be poor, I want you to understand one other thing. There are 3 billion people in this country that make less, in this world that make less than $2.50 a day. You think they choose that? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think it's time for us to think differently about this because, quite frankly, if we don't, then in the next 90 days, just like the last 90 days, another 25,000 kids are going to lose their lives unnecessarily in the Horn of Africa, where there are about 15 million lives at risk. Did you read about that in the paper today, or yesterday, or the day before? How is it possible that we could live in a society where this many kids are losing their lives, are living in squalor and desperation, and this many lives are at risk, and we don't even know it. We don't even talk about it. We're in the wrong place in terms of how we are connecting with the broader society. We have work to do. Fortunately, people are beginning to rise up. Sometimes rising up looks like this person in Tahrir Square last spring. Sometimes rising up looks like this, and London, 
David Cameron blamed that rage on bad parenting. Sometimes it looks like this. Now you can argue whether Occupy Wall Street was just an inconvenience, which it was probably to some of you a year or so ago, or whether it was successful. I would offer only this. The Republican nominee for president has had to defend his record of business success. That hasn't happened before. There's a different conversation happening today than there was a few years ago. In fact, it continues today. You know who that is? That's a Russian band called Pussy Riot that made the mistake of criticizing the Russian government. And so they were detained and now thrown in jail for hooliganism? Three years? Two years. Oh, I'm sorry, only two years. Right. Okay. Um, just think Dixie Chicks, right? It's the same kind of deal, except they've been thrown in prison. People are rising up. I think it's time for businesses to rise up and behave differently. This slide is misleading. It says businesses can be a powerful force for social change. Unfortunately, that powerful force has too often been for negative social change. I think businesses can be a powerful force for positive social change. And I think that's what you're here to learn and extend and engage in and support and endorse and advocate. That's what your next two years and your career ought be about because that's what this place is about. If you take what you learn here and use it only to generate personal wealth or shareholder value, shame on you. But I think you got up this morning because that's not what drives you. I think you got up this morning because you are called to more. I said before that there is a deep moral argument in businesses serving. There's also a deep economic argument. No business can succeed in a community that's failing. Not in a sustainable way, anyway. Right? Henry Ford said almost 100 years ago, if we don't pay our workers adequately, they can't buy our products. That's where we are. There is a collapse of consumer demand on a global basis because we have a separation of the rich and the less fortunate that is almost unprecedented. It's time for us to think about things differently. We all understand that. There's now a conversation. Guys like me get to be asked to have this conversation with you. It didn't happen 10 years ago and 15 years ago. So we're thinking about things differently. That's really good. How are we doing? How are we doing on this? So let's just talk about how we're doing. I think we are too often doing what we can as business leaders instead of what we should. And I think the gulf between those two things is enormous. Let me give you a couple of examples. If you go back a little better than 10 years now, you may remember when Katrina roared across the Mississippi and Louisiana and a Gulf Coast. In Biloxi, Mississippi, which is, anybody been to Biloxi, Mississippi? A couple people, right? Biloxi is a peninsula, right, more or less? So what happened in New Orleans, you may remember, the water rose and stayed there for a long time. That's not what happened in Biloxi. Anybody know what happened in Biloxi? Yes, ma'am. You bet. Effectively, a tidal wave washed in and washed out about an hour later and took 7,000 houses with it. We sit here today and only about 1,000 of those houses have been rebuilt. Now, the effort to rebuild them has been through tremendous work by Habitat for Humanity and the Texas Baptist Men and Hope Community Development Agency. I'm not being critical of the effort, but 7,000 houses went away, and in over 10 years, we haven't been able to replace more than about 1,000 of them. Okay. But in the meantime, we almost immediately reopened nine casinos. Almost immediately. And by the way, gave over the entire land, the entire coast of that peninsula to the casinos. And the idea was if we get the casinos back in here, they'll rebuild the town, they'll bring everything back because they'll make jobs. And God forbid we oppose job creators. Because we're business friendly in this country. We believe that what's good for business is good for the community. I believe the opposite. I believe what's good for the community is good for business. And it's time we started talking that way. That's one example of privatizing profits and socializing costs. There are more. When you walk into Walmart and you recognize that only about a third of those employees have adequate access to health care provided by Walmart, you have to ask yourself the question, how do the other folks get access to health care? Who pays for that? Do you know? It's you. 
Because of a quirk in our historical path, employers have become responsible for providing access to health care for their employees. I'm not arguing whether that's right or that's wrong. That's not the point. It just is. And so when Walmart can constantly dividend billions of profits and increase shareholder value, you have to wonder why they can't provide adequate access to their employees for health care. You have to wonder about that. It's an example of privatizing profits and socializing costs. We've become very good at that. Here's another example. We talked about Katrina, right? And then you remember the FEMA trailers that came in to house so many people all across the Gulf Coast after Katrina. Anybody know what was unusual about those FEMA trailers? Okay, so they couldn't be sold by the manufacturers. You know why? Because they had drywall in them that was soaked in formaldehyde. So within weeks of, of people being housed in those trailers, we had little kids going to the emergency room bleeding from the nose because they were ingesting fumes that were incredibly toxic. It couldn't be sold. So the federal government bought them and stuck our people in them. As if being victimized by the hurricane wasn't bad enough, they were victimized again by an unscrupulous manufacturer and a clueless government. Just as the Gulf Coast was recovering, BP's oil rig blows over. And in Biloxi, for instance, the only industry that was left, did anybody know what it was? Fishing. Fishing. Right. Generations after generations, folks had fished from Biloxi. That was gone, destroyed. Um, I don't know if you know this, but um, in the probably decade before the BP disaster, you know what a, a, a significant number of EPA regulators were doing with BP and other oil officials? They were sleeping with them. I'm not making this up. Not only were we not adequately regulating them, we were enjoying ourselves with them. You can't make this stuff up. Well, how about the banking industry? Well, that could be a speech in its own. But uh, I, I promise you there are an awful lot of people who know what LIBOR is today that didn't a few months ago. But that was OK, right? We're doing what we can instead of what we should. We're doing what we can instead of what we should. Pfizer, it comes to find out, has been bribing doctors in China and in Europe to use their products for years and years. They just paid a, an enormous fine. Last year, it was Johnson & Johnson that was fined for the same thing. We're doing what we can instead of what we should. Why, why are we behaving in this way? It is because we have the wrong meta-narrative. We have a meta-narrative that says, it's me against you in a zero-sum game. I have to win. That's what we celebrate all the time in this culture. I have to win. Flip on the TV. By the way, that reality TV, it's not your reality. And I promise you, it's not my reality. I got no snookies in my life. <laughs> Isn't that how it works? It isn't you against me in a zero-sum game. It's us together creating a better outcome for all. That's how positive, growing, progressive communities sustain themselves. We work together. That's why that's the learning model at Fuqua. That's why you come together to attack problems and figure out solutions. We don't celebrate here an ideology of self-interest. We celebrate here an ideology of community. Community and fellowship, intimacy, is what makes the difference in this world. It's what people seek. I was doing some research recently on 9-11. And I was flipping through tons and tons of pictures. And there was one thing that just kept coming back to me that was incredibly haunting. I've spared you. I'm not going to show you this picture. But you remember learning about how many people jumped from those buildings? Lots and lots and lots of people jumped, dying by jumping instead of dying by fire or collapse or smoke or whatever they thought might be coming. In fact, people who witnessed it said it was like it was raining people. You know what was really fascinating to me? I looked at probably 75 or 80 pictures of people jumping on that day. Almost every one of them was holding hands with another person. Almost every one of them, in their last moment, decided that they wanted intimacy and fellowship and community when they died. It's a basic human need. 
a basic human need. We reach out, we help, and provide hope to one another. This meta-narrative has gone incredibly wrong. Just read that line. It's the morality of altruism, right? Generosity, philanthropy, charity. The, the morality of altruism men have to reject. I, I'm sure you read that line and you think, what the hell? That is crazy. What an abomination. Who would think that? Do you recognize that line? Now do you recognize that line? That's what Ayn Rand believed. We're now celebrating Atlas Shrugged and the work of Ayn Rand. What? It is the morality of altruism that men have to reject? You must be kidding me. That's the basis of civil society. And oh, by the way, Ayn Rand, the campaigner against big government, you do for yourself. Do you know that when she died, she was accepting Social Security and her hospital bed was paid for by Medicare? Come on. I told you you can't make this stuff up. None of us is here alone. All of us has been blessed, have been blessed in significant ways. And I promise you the good Lord didn't give us these many blessings for our own good. Of those to whom much expected, much is given. Much is also expected. Of those to whom much is given, much also is expected. That's how it works. So I think we're behaving this way. We allow this ideology of self-interest to overtake us for a simple reason. I think we're afraid to teach values. Now, all of you should have shuddered and thought, oh my god, now we're going to talk about values. right? So now we get to divide. All right, the whole room would divide up into red and blue. right? It's not what I'm talking about at all. The values I'm talking about are really simple. In fact, there's a terrific book from about five or six years ago called Moral Courage, written by Rush Kidder. Rush went to virtually every continent, went to hundreds of nations, visited with every religious and non-religious kind of community, and he came away with five values that are shared universally, globally. Okay? None of them have to do with the federal budget, so calm down. Okay? This is about the kinds of values that build community. Not the values that divide us, but the values that unite us. These are the values. Now, interestingly, how many people grew up in the YMCA? Anybody grew up in the YMCA here? Yeah, got some Y kids. You recognize any of these values? The first four values are YMCA values. Caring, honesty, respect, responsibility. And the fifth value was fairness or justice. Now, in various different communities, one might be number one, one might be number three. They move around a little bit and all those kinds. They might use slightly different language and whatnot, but that was it. Those are the values. These are the values that drive civil and productive society, where there's adequate opportunity for all, that results in a better environment for all. That's what I'm talking about. So for the rest of the day, when I start talking, by the way, it's only another few minutes, so just in case you're worried that the rest of the day means a long time with me. It's only a few minutes. These are the values that I'm talking about. And so, where should values be taught? Families, churches, that makes sense, I get that. Unfortunately, families look different today than they have in the last 15, 20, 25 years. Churches have fewer fannies in the pews every morning, than every Sunday morning, than they used to. I think values should be taught right here, right here. I think when we talk about how we ought to run our businesses, I think we ought to talk about how we ought to run our businesses. I think we ought to talk about our obligation to the greater good. What we should do instead of what we can do. I don't believe it's a bolt-on elective. I believe it's the way we talk about using all of our skills, knowledge, and abilities for the greater good, for the collective good, for the communal good. We don't have to make the fool's choice. At Fuqua, you don't have to learn to do business or to do good. This is not about not-for-profit being good and for-profit being bad. It's not. We can do business and do good. And by the way, that for-profit, not-for-profit thing, I want you to stop thinking about that as a choice between good and evil. It is a choice between systems of governance and access to capital, and that's it. A for-profit business can have a high mission, 
A nonprofit business can be highly disciplined. The only choices are over governance and access to capital. Decide what work you want to do, then decide what governance system and what access to capital you need, and that'll help you decide what kind of form you need. It's not good versus evil. The second best business school in the country has a journal called the Harvard Business Review. <laughs> Thanks for sticking with me there. <laughs> Last January, January of 2011, actually, Porter and Kramer wrote an article called Creating Shared Value. Perhaps you've read it. What they said in that article was there is a collapse of consumer capacity uh, as the uh, debt kind of capacity goes away, diminishes, and businesses have to think about a completely different way of monetizing their work. How about we monetize our work by doing good and important work? How about we find a way to provide clean water in sub-Saharan Africa and get paid for it? How about if we solve the world's biggest problems? And what they said was not all profits are created equal. Those that carry a social benefit are better. Let's stop with the argument of false equality. If all you're doing is running a business to make money, to increase shareholder value, that's not illegal. I get that. But if you're able to do that and do social good, that's a better business. That's a higher purpose. You're in the best business school on the face of this planet, or certainly could be argued one of the best. That's what we expect of you. Going out to just make shareholders wealthy is a hollow goal, given the opportunities that you have ahead of you. You showed up this morning because you want more. And that's where we are. You're going to hear today about various social enterprises. A social enterprise, according to Jeff Skoll's center, is an organization that challenges conventional structures that cause, and I love this, the unequal distribution of social and environmental goods. The unequal distribution of social and environmental goods by identifying alternatives. That's what a social enterprise does. It doesn't say for-profit, doesn't say not-for-profit, doesn't say it can't be the transformation of an existing business. You don't have to start something necessarily. There are all kinds of opportunities. That's what's happening at the MLAK Center. That's what's happening at TROSA. That's what happens at Habitat for Humanity and Teach for America and at Burt's Bees. These are folks doing important work. That's what a social entrepreneur looks like. Anybody know who that is? That's a woman named Leila Jana. She runs Samosource. Anybody ever heard of Samosource? This is an interesting person. Harvard undergrad, went into the consulting world, decided that there was an opportunity to do important work with people like this. There is the sense, and David Bornstein said this, that the economic superhighway doesn't have enough on-ramps. Leila Jan had decided that with technology where it is today and where it's going, that she could put together a model that would take enormous digital projects, break them down into smaller pieces, and through SAMA source, provide opportunities for micro work for people in impoverished and developing nations. And so she now has about 3,000 people doing work for SAMA source for Fortune 500 companies. Some of it's just data input, some of it's trend analysis, some of it's translation. There are all kinds of different pieces of work. It can be done almost anywhere. There, there is a connection to the digital superhighway. And so people in Kenya, in the center of Nairobi, out in the bush, people in Haiti are working for Samosource, a nonprofit organization that's doing incredibly important work. I love this model, and I love what they're doing. And by the way, Samosource hires only people who are making less than $3 a day. And within a year, they are making four times what the average wage is for people in their area. This is providing economic opportunity by thinking of poor people as producers, as knowledge workers, not just as consumers. But there's no reason to believe these people can't do important work. And in today's technology world, they can be connected to any of us who need this work to be done. Here's another example. Digital Divide Data, which operates in uh, Laos and Cambodia and Vietnam and India and Africa. 
These folks have a similar model. They do similar work, but their delivery platform is just a little bit different. They go out and recruit people from sometimes rural, sometimes urban environments who will not graduate from high school. And they put them in school for half a day, and they work for half a day. And they work on all kinds of data projects. We at Redwoods are considering engaging them. Uh, it was mentioned before that we're in the insurance business. We look at 60,000 incident reports a year. They come in faxed from a camp counselor out in a field someplace. It's hard to get, and it's written out, faxed, and it's hard to get that data in a place where it can be searched. But there's important, rich trend data that's in there. And these people can transcribe that data and put it into a place where we can search it. What a great thing. That's the kind of work that they do. Digital divide data works from offices. 10% of their workforce are people who are seriously physically impaired and in those environments would have no opportunity to work. Digital divide data is a nonprofit organization doing incredibly important work for for-profit companies. Those are two nonprofit examples. How about these guys? You know what those are? Yeah, what kind of, they're, they're so the so, yeah, they're roof tiles, right? Everybody's got to put shingles on the roof. How about instead of having big solar arrays, how about we make the shingles themselves solar power? These are, are called powerhouse shingles. They're made by Dow. By 2015, this will be over a $5 billion product for Dow. Incredibly important work. Convert every rooftop globally into a solar power collector. That seems like a good idea to me. How about these guys? Anybody ever heard of Comportamos? Yes, sir? What do you know about them? Uh, they're back in South America. Mexico. Yeah. yeah. Right. Now, Comportamos is not perfect. Anybody know how Comportamos started? Started as, a, as an NGO, but then they did the IPO. Now they are uh, an open company. OK, so it started as an NGO, which is true. You know what they did? Microlending. They didn't start with microlending. They started by helping people get clothes and food. But they realized that they couldn't start businesses or lift themselves up economically without access to capital. It began micro-lending. And now they're the fastest growing bank in Mexico and now moving out into the rest of South America. Now, when they did the IPO, their owners got pretty wealthy. So there are all kinds of questions about what's been done. But I have to tell you, and it's in a country like Mexico where two-thirds of Mexicans are unbanked, this is important. In Mexico, a savings account looked like a goat. Right? I'm not kidding you. If you had a little extra money, you bought an extra goat. That wasn't the most efficient way to save. This is better. Can it be better? You bet. But it's a step. Comportamos is interesting. There are all kinds of examples. What's this? I'll give you a hint. Bill Gates had a contest in the last few weeks about this. It's a part of a toilet. Bill Gates created a huge reward system for people to design toilets that could be used in developing nations. And the toilet that won not only produces clean water, but fertilizer can be used for crops. You kidding me? I'm not kidding. This is what's possible when we think about using a platform of business to transform society. You know other companies. They're maybe more pedestrian, I guess. If you ask Yvonne Schoenard, the founder of Patagonia, what his company is, if we're asked, we'd say, you know, it's a clothing company or an outdoor equipment company, surfing company. It depends on kind of where you connect with them. You know what Yvonne says? We're an environmental company that sells clothes to fund our mission. That's where we are going to be at Burt's Bees today. You're going to meet Nick Vallejos, who's a terrific guy, chose to be here in Durham. Um, Nick is raising a family. He's just a, a wonderful guy, came out of Clorox, and is loving what he's doing. Burt's Bees creates economic opportunity for honey producers in East Africa, right here in Durham. Seventh Generation is run by the former CEO of Burt's Bees, John Replogle, who's spoken here many times. John is as committed a social entrepreneur as you'll ever meet. Um, when the guys at Timberland went into Haiti to start making shoes, you know what they built before they built a factory? They built a school. They said, here's the deal. I'm delighted to bring some jobs here, but I don't want your kids working for me. So we're going to educate them so that they will create their own economic opportunities. I think it's possible that our company is a social enterprise that's successful. Uh, this is our business model. What it says is we're here to serve. We're here to serve. That's the reason we started the company, not to make money. Now, there are some folks that have looked at us and said we're doing a good job. It's always been interesting to me 
We'd been in business 13 years when the Wall Street Journal said we were a promising social enterprise. <laughs> you got to wonder about that. But, but it is what it is. I want to just talk about what it means to be in this place and what it is we have to take out into the community. There are three things I think we have to do to be a responsible social enterprise. Here's the first. I think we have to do important work. People ask me all the time, could you be a defense contractor? You could be in alcohol or entertainment or whatever and, 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 uh, and be an effective social enterprise. I think the answer is no. I think the answer is no. Now, if the entertainment you provide lifts people up, instructs them, talks about values, reinforces, right, that's possible. But you have to start by doing important work. So here's our work. Now, you look at that, and what you should see is a bunch of probably relatively wealthy white kids, right? One of them is my daughter, not the one that Matt dates. <laughs> There was that moment that everybody had a concern about Matt. <laughs> but seriously, the reason this is important work is because of this. A hundred thousand kids are sexually abused every year. When the news came out about Jerry Sandusky, by the way, it's one in six boys. When the news came out about Sandusky, from the first moment, we could have told you exactly how he got access to those kids. And we could have told you exactly what could have been done to have recognized the warning signs of kids being sexually abused and to have stopped it 20 years ago. That's the work we do. That's why we started the company. The second thing is we have to do this work really well. We have to do important work, but a lot of people are trying to do important work. When you meet the folks at the, uh, the social service agencies you go to today, today Ask yourselves, what's the important work they're doing? And are they doing it well? Because by the way, whether they're for profit or not for profit, they're all competing for capital, either philanthropic capital or investment, equity capital, debt, whatever it might be. And they all have to compete for that capital just as I do. And so it, it's not enough just to do important work. We have to do that important work well. So let me just give you a, a piece of information. 3,500 people in this country die by drowning every year, 3,500 people. 1,500 of them will be kids. Now, it includes backyards and lakes and bathtubs and all that kind of stuff, but of that 1,500, between a third and a half will be kids who will drown in a pool that has a lifeguard standing on the deck. Now, I know that's counterintuitive. How many of you have ever been a lifeguard? Thank you. Yell at me if I say something wrong. Being a lifeguard is not the easiest job in the world. It's often hot always humid, it can be crushingly boring, and difficult, difficult to remain vigilant hour after hour after hour. Try being in a chair at 7 o'clock in the morning in an inside pool where it's 90 degrees and 90% humidity, and you've been in the chair for an hour and a half, and you're watching people slog their way back and forth and back and forth, and they all look like they're about to drown. <laughs> Lifeguarding's not an easy job. So because there's a glare on the top of the pool and the ripple effect makes it difficult to see down towards the bottom, lifeguarding is tough. And it's tough to see a victim in distress, especially when you know that this is not Baywatch. They don't splash and call your name. They drown silently. They slip beneath the surface, and then they begin to struggle. Lifeguarding is a tougher job than you thought it was. And so doing our important work well means we have to understand the data and the causative factors. And we need to understand how to watch that pool, which is in Bayside, Queens, run by a Jewish community center, and that pool, which is in Spencer, Iowa, run by a YMCA, and that pool, which is the 92nd Street YMHA in New York City. All three are different. All three require different positioning, different scanning techniques, different training, different response. We have to understand the difference between all three of them, because that's how we have to support our customers. 10 years ago, 13 people were dying by drowning in YMCA pools in the United States every year. 13 people were dying by drowning in YMCA pools in the United States every year. We began sneaking on pool decks and beginning to understand all of these dynamics. So we went to work. We were a universal pain in the ass. I know that's hard to believe. You've only known me for a few minutes. But we were a total pain in the ass. We retrained lifeguards. We repositioned them. We changed how they scan the pool, how they respond, how they're drilled and educated. And for the last three years, 2009, 10, and 11, there were zero drownings in pools 
uh, and YMCA's in the United States. Okay? That's, thank you. Thanks. That's what's possible. That's what's possible when what you're working on is important stuff. Now, by the way, it's not just the work you're doing. It's not just providing micro work for people in Kenya. It's not just keeping people from drowning. It's what we do internally as well. We have to understand cultures. And to understand cultures, we have to know, this is YMCA Camp Cheerio in Western North Carolina. It's beautiful. Any of you have been to residential camp, maybe you've had an experience like this. Not every camp looks like that. Some camps look like this. This is in a basement of a church run by a YMCA in Detroit. This is a dialysis camp in Y of the Rockies in Estes Park, Colorado. We have to have people who engage differently with our customers in different circumstances. We have to have people who are citizens of the world, people who can think communally. Otherwise, they can't do this work. I'm not going to do this work by myself. We have to have people who engage differently. So we have to engage differently with our folks. Gary Hamill said, why don't we talk about love, devotion, and honor in corporate -dom? I said before, people want intimacy and fellowship and purpose and connection. That's what they want. People on our staffs are not just tools. They're not machines. They are living, breathing human beings with feelings and capacity and hopes and dreams. And the most important management tool you will ever learn about how to lead people is one you learned in about eighth grade. You didn't know you were going to talk about Abraham Maslow today. If people's most basic needs are not being met, they cannot think communally. Not that they won't, they can't. And so in this prosperous society, that means they have to know they can take their kid to the dock, that they can retire with dignity, they can afford to pay their rent, that they have employment security. We went through a pretty tough time the last three or four years as well. Okay, we're in an insurance business that's artificially soft. We uh, have as our major capital provider AIG. Perhaps you've heard of them. Pretty interesting time when all of your customers are nonprofits in a global economic downturn. So in 2010, we lost money for the first time. We knew it. We planned for it. We had reserved against volatility. We had money in the bank. And every one of our all-employee meetings started with these words. Your jobs are safe. Because if I didn't say that, everything else to our folks would have sounded like this. Wah, 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 right? What does this mean to me? Now that I understand I'm secure, I can think of others, which is where we have to get to. It's the most important thing we have to get to. And so how do you do that? Well, remember I showed you this business model before. What's interesting is right here. I said, this is what we exist for. Stop kids from drowning, keep people from being sexually abused. But we can't do that without what's just right there underneath it. It says, earn a profit. I'm not apologetic about that in any way. You should never be. Whether it's a for-profit organization or a non-profit organization, you have to earn a profit. What? So in a non-profit organization, you've got to create a fund balance, or you've got to create a reserve. There are all kinds of different ways of considering it. But you have to make sure that you bring in a little bit more than you pay out. Because profit is a metric of sustainability. Nothing to be apologized for. We have to find the right way to monetize our work. We have to be disciplined about how we run our businesses. Otherwise, we won't be here tomorrow to do our good work. That's second, do important work well. Three is move the work to scale. You know, I, I spend a lot of time at YMCA's and JCC's and camps, and I go to an awful lot of places where they have a program for kids whose parents are in prison and who are at risk as a result of the incarceration of the parents and who themselves are more at risk of, of later incarceration in life. And it's an amazing program. And, and you say, well, how many kids are in this program? And you know, there's 43 kids. And you say, well, how long have you been running this program? And if it's a year, well, that's OK. You, you, know, you kind of shake out crews, right? You've got to get everything done. But often it's 10 years. So when, when we go to camp and we see you know, two kids benefiting from what camp can be, which, by the way, camp is an opportunity to create leaders of consequence, right? to connect people with the broader world, that's not enough. That's not enough. We want to connect with lots and lots and lots and lots of kids. There are almost 35 million kids in America 
who should be involved in camping in some way, should be involved in an intentional formation of community that helps them to make themselves less important and make others more important. You know how many kids go to camp? Three and a half million. 3.3 million, as a matter of fact. We have an opportunity to grow, to move to scale. That's the work that has to be done. Now, you're going to hear an awful lot while you're here about Duke's mission, which is knowledge and service to society. That's what Duke has stood for for an awfully long time. I heard it when I was here, knowledge in service to society. You heard already this morning, Matt talked about building leaders of consequence. Leaders is one thing, but leaders of consequence is really important. Now, by the way, you will be leaders of consequence. The question is, what kind of consequence will it be? You have the opportunity to determine that. You're here to get an MBA. I get that. I understand that. Not only is that an important resume tool, but what it stands for is what you learned that other people haven't learned, and how you know how to connect those skills and that knowledge with greater consequence for the greater good. This won't be easy, because you will go back into a world that has the wrong meta narrative that has an ideology of self-interest. People will assume you can come into their business and make them immediately profitable. You want more than that. What you want to earn while you're here is not so much an MBA as a master's in moral courage. That's what the next two years can be about. Bobby Kennedy was in South Africa in 1962 talking to a group of people not too far off of your age. It was basically their Peace Corps. They were being sent off into the world. And he talked about how they were going to be received. What he said to them was fascinating. He said, moral courage is a rarer commodity than bravery in battle or great intelligence, yet it is the one essential vital quality of those who seek to change a world which yields most painfully to change. You will go out into a world that is not expecting you to come forward with moral force. They're expecting you to come forward with business skills. I think you'll come forward with both. And I think you can't have one without the other. You're about to head off into Durham today. And while you're there, I'd like you to ask yourself this question. Will you be changed by the world, or will you change the world? Here's what I mean. You remember reading all the emails and things around the time of Barclays and the LIBOR crisis and all that kind of stuff? And remember the incredibly embarrassing stuff that people were saying back and forth, guys who were totally immersed in this ruse, what unbelievable things they said to one another. Do you think those are bad people? Do you think they're totally immoral people disconnected with what's right in life? Or do you think they were immersed in an environment that expected that kind of behavior from them? That's what I think. I think people are genuinely good. And I think they respond to their environment, good or bad. And when the environment calls out the worst in us, we give it to them. When the environment, on the other hand, calls out the best in us, we give them that. Part of our responsibility as leaders is to create environments where people are rewarded for and encouraged to do their best, to be the best they can be, to live by their highest values. That's an important change. That's what you're seeing in Durham. Matt talked a little bit about the fascinating history of Durham. It's, it is wonderful. It is just wonderful. It has been at the epicenter of an awful lot of things. And today, it's at the epicenter of social enterprise, which is interesting. I lived here in 1967. I remember this Durham with the tobacco business booming. I was also here quite a bit in the late 1980s. When that's the tobacco, those are the tobacco warehouses with empty lots around them. What you really can't see is that by the early 90s, this was a heroin shooting gallery, an unpleased area that was as dangerous as any place in America. That's what it was. Until a visionary named Jim Goodman says, I think we can make something bigger out of that. I think we can engage and lift up Durham by lifting up this piece of the region that is right at the center of the region, and this is what it looks like now. So whether it's Durham Bulls Athletic Park or Durham Performing Arts Center or the burgeoning central city where what used to be the Black Wall Street, this place has changed. And it's changed in incredible and dramatic ways. And so I'm here today not just to talk on and on at you, but to invite you to engage. 
to invite you to lift this place where people want and deserve and will respond to opportunity. What we've done is not even close to enough. We are better than we were here. But we're not where we need to be. In the 60s, Dr. King was talking to a group at the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And pastor after pastor came up and said, I got another 35 people registered to vote. I got another 50 people who walked, sat in, whatever. And Dr. King stood up at the end, and as I understand, he was able to do, he took the oxygen out of the room. And he said, you know, we have a lot of work to do. And we're not doing enough. He said, let us not be tranquilized by the narcotic of gradualism. It's time. There's more to do. And you are the folks to do it. If not you, who? If not now, when? You woke up this morning with an enthusiasm to connect. I thank you for that. You self-identified as people who want not just skills, but who want more, who want to lead a life of consequence. Now you have a better sense of the place you're in and the time you find yourself here and of what we need in Durham, in the South, in America, and in the world. I have great hope because of you. Thank you for asking me to be here today. Ask questions, communicate, connect, whatever, uh, which is fine. Uh, easiest email address in the world, Kevin Trapani at redwoodsgroup.com. Just drop me a note, okay? While you're here, I would love to be helpful to you. Thank you, Kevin. From Net Impact and Case, we just wanted to thank you so much for bringing that message to us today. Thank you. Like Kevin said, if any of you would like to get in touch with him, please do. Um, I, I, it's a talk like Kevin's, you know, that stops Mark and I from thinking about tickets and name tags and the things we've been doing to prepare for this event and reminds us why we're here and what's shaping us to be better business leaders. So thank you, Kevin, for the message. Um, it's a day like today and a talk like his and my experience last year uh, that's helped shape my career in thinking around the social sector and where we can plug in, and I know for Mark and for all of us. And we hope that for you today that you'll pause and reflect on what Kevin's talked about, what you're hearing today, and then your experience here at Fuqua and what you want it to be and how you want it to shape you. Going back to being logistics queen, I'm going to ask a few things of you guys today. Um, first of all, if you do not have a name tag, like we said, there are some in the lunch rooms, and you should be able to find those when you go have your lunch. Uh, just write your name on there so we know who you are. Uh, some of you have not checked in uh, and need a ticket to get on the bus. Those tickets are just pieces of paper, but they're really important, and someone's going to be collecting them from you as you enter the bus. So make sure that you have one. And if you haven't gotten one, that you go to the customer service area that we've set up in the lunchroom and make sure that you check in. Couple of thank yous. This day has been three or four months in the planning, and I wanted to thank Ruth Tolman particularly for being a huge support. She's worked in the case office in the past and will be available to you this year uh, through career services. Is that correct, Ruth? Student services. Student services. Uh, so thank you for all of your help. To Kevin, we've, we've thanked you again. It's always a pleasure to have you, and we really appreciate your presence here. To our major institutional sponsors, John Deere, Deloitte, and Education Pioneers, this event truly could not have happened without their support. And to our FUQA sponsors, uh, particularly Matt Nash, the case executive director, uh, Dan Vermeer, who some of you will hear from in the sustainability track, is the executive director of EDGE, 
uh, and to several other clubs that you'll be hearing more about through the rest of the year, the HSM, Health Sector Management Club, a Healthcare Club, Duke MBA Consulting, uh, and then Finance Club. So that just gives you a, 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 an insight into the breadth of organizations that support a day like this. Uh, again, thank you to uh, our FUQA Dean, Bill Bolding, for showing up today, and for Russ Morgan, also your presence here, our Daytime <laughs> Dean. We really appreciate your leadership of the school and for being here today. One or two more announcements. You're going to be going to lunch now, followed by your tracks afterwards. Uh, we're going to go ahead and release excursion D and E first, uh, because you will be in these rooms, RJR and Jenkins, which are past the Fox Center uh, in the other direction of where the other people will be going. Um, so thank you for coming. And D and E, feel free to head out now. Don't. Yeah. Oh, hold it one second. I apologize. Don't forget to tweet. Don't forget to take photos. And there is an event that we're trying to promote today. Uh, it's at BAT, uh, Habitat for Humanity. You can purchase tickets outside for a game that's tomorrow. Uh, look for Vin in the lunchroom. All the proceeds go to uh, Habitat for Humanity. Okay. d and &E, please leave. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.